Hello, you are watching another episode of TV Toastmasters in Portland. My name is Teresa Griffin Kennedy. I'm a local area writer and author, and I have a wonderful guest today. Um, she's an author in Portland. Her name is Jennifer Robin, and I've actually interviewed her before. Um, she's published one book um, about a year and a half ago. Um, it's called Death Confetti, and she's publishing her second book, which is called Earthquakes in Candyland. Um, Jennifer Robin is a very popular author, poet, and performance artist in Portland. And it's good to have you here, Jennifer. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You've made me feel very welcome, Teresa. Very good. So um, we're both writers, we're both authors, and um, basically I just wanted to have you on the show so we could talk about what we know, which is writing in books and publishing and the frustrations of getting published. Um, your second book is called Earthquakes in Candyland. How is that different from Death Confetti? In some ways, it's a natural progression from Death Confetti. So Death Confetti was released on Feral House, and they are a publisher that specializes mainly in nonfiction. And they had originally approached me because I had, I was on Facebook and posting mm -hmm. a lot of stream of consciousness street reportage. Mm -hmm. Characters I was meeting on buses, people I was seeing in transit malls, in supermarkets, a lot of random encounters that yeah. then I would write about in sometimes a humorous and sometimes dark, mm -hmm. poetic, journalistic tone. Yeah. And so based on the success of that book, I was approached by the second publisher, Fungasm, and Fungasm. Fungasm. <laughs> and they really appreciated mm -hmm. both my the surrealistic touches in my writing, but also the journalistic style. Mm -hmm. And then they asked me, they gave me a very ambitious pitch, mm -hmm. which was to carry on with a lot of the street reportage and some of the political overtones and death confetti and write a book about America oh, in wow. my voice, in my style. Mm -hmm. And so that has been a very ambitious request, which I personally would, if I was going through my daily affairs as a writer, I probably would not proclaim to myself, I am the one to write the book about America. America. But, <laughs> but <laughs> the enthusiasm of this pitch and my discussions with this publisher made me mm -hmm. realize that this is what I was subconsciously working on for a long time. Sure. That a lot of my pieces were, especially the sketches of people I'd meet, were like a patchwork quilt mm -hmm. that when put together, each patch was creating a, not just a portrait of characters in a city or income equality or the eccentricities in our nation, but mm -hmm. it was, I was very, I, it wasn't localized anymore. Mm -hmm. I realized, I've been leading up to this ambitious project. Because you've lived in lots of other places besides just Portland. You've lived in uh, New York, right? Yeah, and I, I lived in New York and Baltimore, Maryland. And you um, went to Paris? Uh, yes, I, wow. I've, I lived in France for a little while. Mm -hmm. I lived in London for a little while. But the majority of my life, I've been in New York or Portland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, is it different um, than Death Confetti in the sense that some of the sketches, some of the vignettes are a little more intimate? Yes, some of the vignettes are more intimate and it seemed like a progression that had to happen after what I had accomplished with Death Confetti. Mm -hmm. A lot of the street sketches in Death Confetti involve me being more of a voyeur, watching mm -hmm. people from afar. Sure. There are some of the stories in which the characters do approach me. Mm -hmm. And then we end up having conversations and I hear people's deeper life stories mm -hmm. or, or, or pleas or, mm -hmm. or projections that they need to make. Mm -hmm. But in the stories here, especially with what I was requested I do as an author, I have more deliberate interviews and me immersing myself further in the mm -hmm. lives of the characters, sometimes in ways that compromise or challenge me. Mm -hmm. And and so it's much more immersive journalism. Mm -hmm. 
in earthquakes in Candyland. What I liked about uh, Death Confetti and what I could definitely relate to is um, all the characters that you would meet on the bus. Yes. Because I was a writer of TriMet for 45 years. I mean, 40 years. I mean, probably since I was five or six, but a long time. Yes. <laughs> so a lot of those stories that you have in Death Confetti, I could totally relate to. Um, you know, and I think what comes across also in Death Confetti is um, your sense of compassion for people and uh, humor, you know, and you don't sacrifice one or the other um, in, telling your, in telling your stories because these are all creative, these are all nonfiction. Yeah. Yeah. And in the, in the f I carry on that feeling <coughs> in Earthquakes in Candyland because I, I never feel like I am more together mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or on a higher echelon of stability or sanity than the people I write about. Oftentimes it's something fractured about them that contacts mm -hmm. what I feel is fractured in my nature and I feel an intimacy or a kinship with a lot of the people yeah. I'm drawn to write about. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's time I'll, I'll read a couple paragraphs. Yeah. Um, but feel free to <laughs> ask. So other than other than um, Earthquakes in Candyland, are you working on any other projects? I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like a writer generally yeah. works on multiple projects at the same time. Right now, I'm still in the subconsciously working on the other projects. Mm -hmm. After I finish with this book, I've committed with a couple other publishers to That's work wonderful. on. The next one I must complete is totally different from this journalism. It's it's I've been asked to do a supernatural fantasy, and like like fiction. Yeah, fiction. Oh wow! And and then the book I'll be doing after that will be putting an anthology of or putting together a collection of a lot of comic and tragic stories about my relationships and and, mm -hmm. and a, a lot of the comic things about love and relationships sure. that have not fit into the themes of my other projects mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. so i'm all over the place <laughs> with, yeah. with style and and material that's wonderful yeah i i'm working on a novel a comic novel uh Talionic night in portland i i came up with that title just I don't know how I did, but Talionic. What is it that means? Mean? Punishment in kind, or punishment equal to an offense, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I just love the word. I really well, the like the word. The concept packs a punch as well. Yeah, it's been so fun. I mean, I've I've got five chapters written, and I'm just like laughing, and it's just I don't know, but. Um, so you talking about um, writing about intimate relationships and kind of the comedy of love. Oh yes. The comedy and the drama and the pathos of love. I can totally relate to that um, because it is funny, especially as you get older, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Well, a lot of the <laughs> fantasies people have that break down where, yeah. where people think that they could maintain the freshness of romance mm -hmm. or the... Right. Or... Uh, right. All, all, a lot of people have a fear of deeper commitment. So mm -hmm. the minute a single mistake is made, rather than talk their way through it, mm -hmm. rather than have any kind of mediation, they're, oh, I'm on to the next thing. And that's part yeah. of the comedy of Yeah, I, I haven't had a lot of relationships. I've been married three times. But what I've learned is that it's so important to have fun. You know, it's really important to maintain a level of fun in a relationship. And mm -hmm. when that goes. Yeah, humor. <laughs> yeah. A sense of humor is yeah. integral. To all endeavors. Yeah. And, and I'm glad to say my third husband and I have that, which is nice. But um, you have some, um, you have some, uh, some stories here. And did you want to read from, from one of them? I, yeah, I can read. I brought a couple things with me. One was about a panhandler, and the other one was about, um, which was very recently written, was from a trip to New Orleans. And I'll, since we're probably short on time. I'll just read the New Orleans, okay. a few paragraphs from it. So this one involves a, I, I guess for most people, taking her in, you'd call her teenage street punk mm -hmm. and semi-homeless. She said she lived in a friend's trailer outside of town and 
So her name is Marilla, and she's introduced me to her friend Cade. And in varying degrees, they both live for various drug experiences sure. and and thrills that they can get and and they enjoy their status as being outside of what they see as mm -hmm. a ridiculous society so mm -hmm. i'll just read a few paragraphs from this and and it's also an example an example of me being more immersive with them i got to mm -hmm. know marilla and kate over a few days of the week and hung mm -hmm. out with them and cool. and this I, d I hung out with them as long as I could mm -hmm. because it was exhaustive. Mm -hmm. And sure. their needs, their, and their lifestyle <laughs> were sure. exhaustive. So I'll just read a quick few paragraphs from this. Marilla has green pills and Cade has blue pills and we walk in the cold to the voodoo store and stare at a shrine of a goat god who is the same color blue as Cade's pills with breasts and slanted eyes and a pentagram on its forehead. I want to buy and hold and know the goat god but I'm stopped by a sign that says no photos please don't touch. The essential oil is whack. The sandalwood smells like fabric softener. Marilla says she has hexed enemies many times, and sometimes she also hexes friends because a hex doesn't doom you. It only makes the bad things that are going to happen to you happen faster, and then you can have them out of the way. Marilla and Cade and a friend called Creeper Steve, who is 45, and trades them a small bag of mushrooms, which may or may not be psychedelic, for other things in their pockets, move through the French Quarter, often walking in circles in a way that makes them appear lost. We take a train to the cemetery and talk about memory and why the sky isn't green. And Cade wants to tell us all about a rapper who he wishes he could listen to right now because the rapper is so deep and feels so much that he'd understand the meaning of these buildings and the dead flowers on every shelf containing skin flap bones. And inside this crypt is a metal tray that must have held wreaths. And it looks rusty and Cade jumps on it and rolls back and forth on the marble floor. And at the last minute, it keeps himself from knocking a vase off a shelf with a name like Henrik carved so serious and so extinct. And that's a quick excerpt and that is written in a one of the more poetic styles sure. in the book and others are more like political essays. So mm -hmm. it's a this book is going to be a patchwork when that's it comes wonderful. out. That's wonderful. You have a very stream of consciousness style and it's super loaded. Um, it's definitely um, your writing is often very poetic. Um, in the way that you load your language with meaning and um, it's very tight and very concise and you don't, you know, you don't um, burden anyone with excessive <laughs> words. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think I follow uh, White and Strunk's, I think it's rule number seven, omit all unneeded words. It's like my rule, you know, that's a great book by the way, but um, that's my, you know, I always, I'm asking myself, do I need, do I need to have that word there? Mm -hmm. And I've spent, you know, minutes and sometimes hours obsessing over a sentence or two or three words because I want to get it just right. Oh, writing you know. is mathematics. Yeah. And it's funny because a lot of writers do not have num numerical mathematical aptitude, oh, but yeah. we are working with very precise mm -hmm. time signatures and yeah. equations of meaning right. in Right. With these words. That's actually really true. Um, my math skills are, are just horrible. <laughs> Sadly, mine are as well. And I know a lot of writers that seem to really excel with, um, with language. I mean, that's definitely what they're into. Um, you know, that's the part of their brain that works the best. And when it comes to math and sometimes, you know, um, other things, they're not the most proficient. I like to think I'm a logical person, um, and I think I am to a degree, but my math skills are just not very good. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, writing is exhausting, and I've discovered that it takes a long, long time to really become proficient. Um, I started writing when I was 18, and um, I'm 52 now, and when I turned 50 two years ago was really the year that my writing really seemed to take off. Mm -hmm. And things just started to make more sense, and my writing really seemed to coalesce in a way that it hadn't before. 
Um, and I only started writing fiction about a year and a half, two years ago, about two years ago, because I, I was a militant creative nonfiction writer, mm -hmm. you know, who looked down on fiction. You know, what's the big deal? What is everyone always talking about, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then I thought about writing fiction for probably five years, and um, because essentially I am a very cautious person, so I have to think about things for a long time before I do anything. Yeah. Um, and uh, I started writing fiction about a year and a half, two years ago, and it's so fun. It's different from from nonfiction, from creative nonfiction, um, because there's not so much at stake. You don't have to do as much research. Um, so when you when you think about writing fiction, um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I come from the reverse as you, because I thought I was going to be a fiction writer for a lot of my adult life. Mm -hmm. That when I was a teenager, I had ambitions to be a journalist, mm -hmm. and I became a high school. It was called the high school correspondent for the local newspaper, mm -hmm. and I I learned a lot. Like, a bullet point version of journalism that sure. the adults had time to tell all the kids who were writing for them and doing editorials or other interviews. Mm -hmm. And I, I was somewhat disappointed when, because I had a far more romantic idea of journalism. Mm -hmm. I thought, ah, oh, one can be a foreign correspondent and unfailingly expose the lies, and, you right. know, all, all of the usual. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had a, a much more leftist <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, there's always corruption and I'm going to find it view of journalism. Yeah. And the more I saw, even as a teenager working with this newspaper, I saw, oh, they get everything from the AP pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah. And, and there's not, there's not this raw you can't uncovering have of data that mm -hmm. I was hoping to see reporters actively. And of course I was also a kid and they weren't showing me everything they mm -hmm. were doing, but nevertheless I started going, well, I'll have to think more about if that's my ambition. And, and then my own interest started leading me in a more abstract direction. Yeah. And I thought, I, I started enjoying using fiction mm -hmm. in, in a way that, say, Kurt Vonnegut does, that he's talking about very S very real issues as far as the, the compulsions and, and political scandals and, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the baser nature of the human race, but he's doing it with yeah. humor and a lot of science fictional metaphors. You know, I've never read him and I feel bad because I really should. <laughs> um, but I did discover a, a new writer recently, uh, Richard Lang, who lives in LA, who wrote a book of short stories called Sweet Nothing, and he's amazing. I just love him. He's like, I love it when a writer has range. Yeah. And he has real range. And range and being able to demonstrate that I have range as a writer is important to me. Um, and I, I am writing my novel in second voice, which I, is really cool. There's something about second voice mm -hmm. that is really immediate and intimate. And um, I don't know, it's just, it's interesting. I, you know, A Bright Light's Big City by, um, uh, uh, Jay McInerney, yeah. he wrote that in second voice, and yeah. that was kind of like... Oh, it, it's a great voice to use, it and is. I, I use it in some of the pieces here as well. It is, and it, it's an amazing book, and I wish I had read it 20 years ago, but yeah. I finally got around to reading it a few months ago, and I just loved it. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do that, Yeah, <laughs> because it's so inclusive, kind of, in a way, and you read it, and you just mm -hmm. feel like you're oh, along for the ride. It's truly immediate. You know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, but, but, um, oh, I was going to, I'll just close mm -hmm. with saying that for most of my adult life, my thoughts that fiction was this playground where you, mm -hmm. you could, it was like taffy. You can stretch it out and do whatever you want with the mm -hmm. plot line and ultimately, if you wish, wind it back to a statement or, mm -hmm. or a theory of some sort. But the more I started blogging nonfiction, mm -hmm. I got such a following for the immediacy of the nonfiction yeah. that it, it was a very different relationship I started developing yeah. with readers. Mm -hmm. And it much more like live performance. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I've been doing for the past four years especially. And I need to, I need to go and see uh, one of your performances because you read really well as you showed us today. You're a really great reader. 
So this is uh, the conclusion of the show of this episode of uh, TV Toastmasters. And my guest was Jennifer Robin. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And I hope that you watch another show. Uh, this is a great show. And we are able to interview wonderful guests. And uh, my name is Teresa Griffin Kennedy. And thank you again for tuning in to TV Toastmasters. Thank you. I joined Toastmasters to improve my speaking, listening, communication, and leadership skills. Toastmasters gave me incredible confidence. 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 Great listening skills. Poise. Great leadership skills. Leadership skills. The ability to speak in public. Strength. A captive audience. Quality feedback from the more experienced Toastmasters. Toastmasters really helped me improve my listening skills. Sales skills opportunities to go to different groups and widen my whole horizon. Toastmasters has given me a better, a more focused me, and I'm a much better listener. Toastmasters is fulfilling. It's a great place to fail your way to success. Wonderful way to meet people. Networking. Strength. It's addictive. It's a club of self-improvement. It's an experience, it's a ride that you won't forget and you'll enjoy it every step of the way. Toastmasters helped me land a kick butt job. I sang at one of my table topic speeches and people liked it and applauded. My business is doing great and I'm very, very grateful to Toastmasters. It's been a great experience for me. Thank you, Toastmasters. Thank you, Toastmasters. Thank you, Toastmasters, for giving me so much confidence. Thank you, Toastmasters, for everything.
I used to be afraid of leading a meeting at work. I was more comfortable talking to my computer screen. When I used to send an email to a group of coworkers to work on a project, I couldn't sleep the night before thinking of what I would say or how I would face them. Then there were times I just wanted to disappear. Then I joined a Toastmasters club. I found a safe place where I could practice on roles during the meeting, such as the Toastmaster, Evaluator, Timer, among others, without worrying about mistakes. The members are supportive and encouraging, and we have fun. Thanks to Toastmasters, I now lead with confidence and ease.